So the other division of the skeleton is the appendicular skeleton. The function of the appendicular skeleton is movement. There's 126 bones in the appendicular skeleton. So this would be your arms and your legs, as well as your shoulders and your hips, because those are providing an attachment point for the arms and the legs. So pectoral girdle would be the shoulders and the upper limbs. Pelvic girdle would be the hips and the lower limbs. Of the 126 bones, most of those we find in the hands and the feet. So starting at the pectoral girdle, we have the clavicles and the scapulae. These attach the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. And the clavicles and scapulae form a shallow socket for the arm. The positive about having a shallow socket it is that it allows maximum movement at the shoulder joint. If you move your upper arm at the shoulder, you can move it in almost any direction because of the shallow socket. However, there's also a negative with a shallow socket. That means that it's poorly reinforced and it lacks stability meaning it's more likely to dislocate a shallow socket sort of a joint. So there's going to be trade-offs. We're going to have maximum movement with our upper limbs, but the price we pay for that is that it's poorly reinforced and it is more prone to dislocation because of that. The upper limb 30 bones in each limb. We have the humerus, which is the upper arm bone. And then the forearm or the lower bones are the radius and the ulna. Now the radius and the ulna are one of the main reasons we have the anatomical position because you can see in this diagram, if the arm is just hanging down at the side like we normally would have our arm, the radius and the ulna are gonna overlap and it makes it difficult to see the individual bones as well as if we were looking at other structures like muscles and blood vessels and things like that. The radius in the anatomical position is the lateral bone and the radius is always in line with the thumb. The radius is going to form a majority of the wrist joint. The ulna is the medial bone, always in line with the pinky, and it forms the majority of the elbow joint. So if you ever see a diagram that's not in the anatomical position, you can always find the radius by finding the thumb, and you can always find the ulna by finding the pinky. This is not in your notes packet, but this is kind of interesting information. When you are feeling your wrist and you feel those bumps kind of on the side of your wrist, both you have a lateral and a medial bump, those are not your wrist bones. Those are actually called the stylus process of the radius and the stylus process of the ulna. So those are parts of those forearm bones and you're feeling the protrusion of the ends of those bones. So the hand, there's three major divisions of bones in the hand. We have the carpals or the wrist bones. There are eight different wrist bones and these are considered short bones because they're kind of tube-like and they allow movement by sliding or gliding over each other. You are not gonna need to know the eight individual names of the bones, but you should know that there are eight carpals. The metacarpals form the palm and there are five metacarpals. And then for phalanges, there are 14 phalange bones that form our fingers or our digits. We have three phalanges in all fingers except your pollux or your thumb. You only have two phalanges in your thumb. And if you bend your fingers at the joints, you can actually see each individual phalange. So now moving to the pelvic girdle. The pelvis is made of two coxal bones. So your pelvis is not one structure, it's actually two separate hip bones. 
one on each side of the sacrum. These will attach the lower limbs to the axial skeleton. And unlike the pectoral girdle, the coxal bones of the pelvic girdle form a very deep socket. And the positive with that is that it's a very secure socket. It's much less common to have dislocations of the femur or the upper leg bone. The trade-off for that, though, is that you have more limited movement because it is a deep, secure socket. And if you move your femur or your leg at your hip joint, you'll notice you have less movement than you do if you move your arm at your shoulder joint. So that is one single coxal bone. We actually have two, which make up both sides of the pelvis. And each coxal bone is made up of three individual bones that have fused together. So as children, they are separate, but then as you go through development, by the time you're an adult, they have fused together. So the ilium is the large flaring bone. And so like if you put your hands on your hips, you're resting your hands on the ilium of each coxal bone. It's the superior portion. The ischium is the posterior inferior portion, meaning it's the back bottom portion. Um, one way to remember that it's the ischium, if someone has a bony butt, that's their ischium that you're feeling if they were to sit on your lap. And then the pubis, that is the anterior portion or the front portion. So you can see all of those pieces separate, but then they're fused together to form one coxal bone on each side of the sacrum. So this is just showing an anterior view of the coxal bone and the three bones that make it up along with the sacrum, and then a posterior view of the same thing. Male and female pelvises are different. And the main differences are because of childbirth. Females have light, thin bones, whereas males have heavy, thick bones for their coxal bones. Females have a false pelvis that is shallow, and males have a false pelvis that's very deep. Females have a wide pelvic cavity, Males have a narrow pelvic cavity. Females have a pelvic inlet that is round or oval shaped. Males have a pelvic inlet that's heart shaped. In females, the subpubic angle is very large, which makes the pelvis more wide. Males, the subpubic angle is small, making the pelvis more narrow. Females, the coccyx is straight and flexible which aids in being able to move during childbirth. And in males, the coccyx is curved and more rigid, not have as much movement, but there's no need for that movement. Here is just a comparison of female versus male pelvis. And again, another comparison. So here is a x-ray of a male pelvis. Um, this is actually an x-ray of my father's pelvis. So um, I had told you earlier that he had been in an accident where the scaffolding that him and his company were working on um, collapsed and they fell and that's how he broke his neck and his back. Um, exactly a year later, he ended up falling off of a roof. The ladder um, was on ice and it slipped out from under him and he ended up breaking his pelvis or his coxal bone. Um, so in this x-ray, you can actually see how they had to use all kinds of titanium screws to actually um, put his pelvis back together since it had fragmented when he had fallen and broken it. Also, when we talked about that anterior interbody cervical fusion earlier, we said that a piece was taken off of the um, coxal bone or the hip bone to then fuse in the cervical vertebrae. On this x-ray, you can actually see right up here 
that is the piece that is missing that was taken a year earlier for his cervical fusion. So we're able to see that in this x-ray as well. The lower limb, there are 30 bones in each lower limb. There is the femur, which is the upper leg or the thigh bone. That is the longest, strongest bone in the entire body. In an adult, it's approximately one fourth of an adult's overall height. In the lower leg, we have the tibia. That is the medial lower leg bone. That is receiving most of the weight of the body and it's forming most of the knee joint with the femur. The fibula is the lateral lower leg bone. Um, it doesn't really receive much weight. It's just there for extra support. Um, if you have a hard time remembering tibia versus fibula, if you think of a fib as being a little lie that you tell, the fibula is the smaller of the lower leg bones, and it's the one that's more lateral. And then the patella is the kneecap. Um, infants or up to about age two, young children do not have a bony patella. It starts as cartilage, and then by the age of two, it has ossified to an actual bony kneecap or patella. Um, another set of uh, extra information, this is very similar to the styloid process we talked about um, with the radius and the ulna. The bumps you feel on your lateral ankles are not ankle bones. Those are called the malleolus. There's the lateral malleolus and the medial malleolus that are actually protrusions from the end of the fibula and the tibia. And then on to the foot. So the makeup of the foot is very similar to the makeup of the hand. We have tarsals, which are the ankle bones, or technically it's the posterior half of the foot. There are only seven tarsals. The metatarsals make up the midfoot, and there are five. And then the phalanges, make up your toes or your digits. Each toe, even though they seem very tiny, each toe has three phalanges, except for your hallux or your big toe, which only has two, similar to your thumb of your hand. Another interesting thing about the foot is that it's made up of three arches. And the arches are important because they're going to help distribute the weight of the body. So the three arches are formed by tarsal and metatarsal bones, and they're strengthened by ligaments and tendons. They allow the foot to support the weight of the body. So you can see how the arches look from all those different angles of the foot. There are different versions of the arches. You could have a normal arch. And so you can see the normal arch, how it would look from the side, how it would look from the back, and how the footprints would actually look with someone with a normal arch. You could have an extra high arch. And if you have a high arch, you're going to actually notice a difference from the back view. And you'll also notice a difference in the footprints. Individuals with high arches, that can cause some back pain and it can cause foot pain because the weight is being distributed a little bit differently. And sometimes to um, accommodate this, you can get special inserts for shoes that help to support that extra high arch. On the other hand, you could have a flat or a fallen arch. And you're also gonna notice this from the back side, and you'll see this as well in the footprints. And again, this can cause some back problems some foot problems, and again, a special arch support in the, sh in the shoe can help with that. 